This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number 12, Three Unforgettable Days. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 1 through verse 27. We come now to Ezekiel chapter 24, and this will bring us to the end of the uh, third part of the book of Ezekiel so far. We noticed in chapter 21 there was a key word that ran through the messages. Remember? Sword. And in this chapter there are three messages and they all single out three days in the prophet's life. And so I've called this chapter Three Unforgettable Days. Verse 2 speaks of the first day. Mortal, write down the name of this day, this very day. So it's obviously a very important day, whatever it is. And then uh, down at the end in verse 25 and verse 27, Uh, we have mention of another day, and in 26, the day, the day, the day, running through 25 through 27. And in the, in the middle part, we, we don't have mention of a day, but we do have mention of morning and evening and morning in verse 18. And that is a separate day. And so, two cases, the precise word day, uh, in these messages, and then, uh, in one case, an obvious allusion to another day. Verse 1 begins with a particular date. And we think, ah, we've met this practice before. And we read in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. But if we were to look more closely and compare it with all the other references to dates in Ezekiel, this one doesn't match. It doesn't match in its format. It it matches uh, okay in the the particular time that it refers to, but the form, the calendar form, isn't the same. And in fact, uh, it it doesn't conform to the uh, uh, chronological references in Ezekiel, but it does to the way that chronological references come in Second Kings. And in fact, this is a reference to, uh, this is taken from, this date is taken from Second Kings 25 and verse 1. And that date is uh, when uh, the beginning of the siege took place, when the Babylonian army came and initiated that long siege. That was the beginning. And so this seems to be a, a, a borrowing. Originally there seemed to have been no date, but it's, it's, quite, <laughs> it's quite easy to see how um, at some point, what was that date? Oh, we've got it in Kings. Well, let's put it in, 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 in here. But um, if you look, it's a different format. But what it turns out to, to, to be, we can... Uh, we can sort out when it was. It was in January 588 BC in our chronology. So we, we know when it was. We know when uh, King says it was. Anyway, in verse 2, mortal, write down the name of this day, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And so there it is. Uh, there's this uh, this information that is being given here to Ezekiel. And, of course, it's a very important day. Uh, you, you, you might compare it to uh, 1945 when the Russians reached the outskirts of Berlin. And that was the beginning of the end of the Second World War uh, in uh, Europe. And, uh, and so it is here. Here is the siege. And uh, it's very likely, eventually, we don't know how long, eventually Jerusalem is going to fall. It's spelled the beginning of the end. 
this beginning of the long siege of Jerusalem. And in terms of Ezekiel's prophesying, uh, it, it, it would be a, a noteworthy nail in the coffin of the exiles' hopes of returning home, those VIPs who had first come in 597 to, uh, to Babylonian exile. But things were getting worse and not, not better. It was a confirmation. It was an encouragement to Ezekiel to be told that what he'd been prophesying about, not knowing when it would happen, well, now it had happened, God tells Ezekiel. But only Ezekiel knew it was a red-letter day. And um, n- n- nobody else uh, knew, in fact, but he's given this, uh, this private information. Uh, and he's told, down, told to write down that date as a confirmation that when it did happen, or rather when news came to Babylon of it happening, which would be even la- later, uh, that then, then it would, um, then it would, um, the, then it would be confirmed. That was what I prophesied. And Ezekiel would be able to say a very sad, I told you so, didn't I? Way back. Uh, referring back to, to the messages that he'd, he'd given about the siege of Jerusalem. But for now, only Ezekiel knew through the extrasensory perception of prophecy. God, as it were, whispers the news in his ear. Uh, it must have saddened him, but to a greater extent, it must have encouraged him as vindication of the negative messages that he'd been transmitting for so long. I shouldn't imagine Ezekiel enjoyed giving those messages. He did in a sense, remember that scroll, that it was sweet as he swallowed it, as he had it in his mouth and swallowed it, but it was a a bitter message uh, in in content. And there must have been mixed feelings for Ezekiel as he gave these dire messages. We've seen how Ezekiel is the master of the extended metaphor. And he shows us once again, uh, here, uh, because from verse 3 onwards, he has this uh, uh, metaphor of a cooking pot, a very ordinary u- utensil in, in every home, a cooking pot used for cooking meat on a fire outside the, the uh, back door of the house, an old cooking pot that had grown rusty with, uh, w- w- with long uh, use. One one might think that these commands given in uh, verses 3 to 5 are addressed to uh, Ezekiel as a sort of symbolic action. Sounds like it at first. Set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also, put in the pieces, all the good pieces, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest one of the flock, pile the logs under it, boil its pieces, seethe also its bones in it. In, in, in China, where I was living last year, there's very much a belief in the beneficial properties of, of bones. And uh, bones are always cooked with, with the meat. In fact, chopped up bones and uh, the marrow in them will, 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 will be good for you. And when it's served on your plate, it's a mixture of meat and bones. And people spit out uh, on, onto the uh, table those little bones. Whereas I delicately took them and put them in my soup bowl. <laughs> uh, and so bones, very valuable because of the uh, rich content of the marrow inside it. Which is an interesting phenomenon here. But in fact... As you look carefully, it's really rhetorical command to Nebuchadnezzar. It's really ordering him, because this is the day when there's a siege of, of Jerusalem. And so the, the, the Nebuchadnezzar is being told here to, uh, to, to get on with the siege and to carry it out and to accomplish the, that, that siege, in fact. And so it's ordering him to initiate the siege, but in these heavily metaphorical uh, terms. And of course, the real addressees, uh, looking on and listening, are the 597 prisoners of uh, war. And the meaning is, the meaning of the message is that Israel's God stands behind the king of Babylon 
in laying siege to Jerusalem. That's what it's really saying. And God is working out his own negative purposes through Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar is implicitly obeying God's orders. The text is not absolutely clear in its details, but we can understand that the siege is being described. And from now on, the people inside the city are like uh, chunks of meat and meaty bones being put in a cooking pot. And things are going to get very hot for them from now on during the siege. And included in the contents are choicest pieces from the best of the flock. In other words, Jerusalem's VIPs are going to be there, locked up behind the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, the royal family of Zedekiah and the royal administration and other socially important people, they're going to be there. The very best of people are going to be there in the pot as meat and bones, but really in the siege. And then verses uh, 6 to 11 refer to the second stage of the metaphor. Verse 11 is going to inform us that it's actually a copper uh, pot. It's made of of copper, this cooking pot. Uh, But it's an old cooking pot, and there's corrosion. And uh, it it speaks of of, of rust, but it's actually the the green corrosion that you get from from old, old copper. Uh, and uh, and there's mention of, of this, this rust. Uh, verse 6, Woe to the bloody city, the pot whose rust is in it, whose rust is not gone out of it. And so you're drawing attention to the corrosion uh, inside this, this, this old pot. And it, it hasn't been cleaned for a long time, just reused and reused and, uh, and left uncleaned. And that rust is going to be uh, is going to be burned out, or rather, that green corrosion is going to be burned out. And so, uh, put more wood on the fire, because now it's time to deal with that pot and to cleanse the pot and get rid of the corrosion. And it's really like our modern practice of having a self a self cleaning oven. And the, 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 the temperature is, is very high so, so that the, the, the dirt in it is changed into little uh, bits of stuff, of white stuff that you can wipe out at, at the end. And so there's this, there's this extra, extra fire. Verse 10, heap up the logs, kindle the fire and uh, stand it empty upon the coal so that it may become hot. Verse 11, it's copper glow, it's filth melt in it, its rust be consumed. And this, of course, this is, at the end of the siege, Jerusalem is going to be set fire to, and all those wooden buildings are going to be consumed. And so, after the inhabitants are taken out, uh, then there's that second stage. And so, a reference to deportation of people from Jerusalem in, in 587, and also a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem by fire. And so that's where you're going in this long extended metaphor of the cooking pot and the fire underneath it. But what does the corrosion stand for? What what is this this corrosion? Well, it's linked with blood, the city of bloodshed, or the bloody city in verse 6. And um, in 22, verse 2, Jerusalem was called the city of bloodshed. And he went on to blame there Jerusalem's leaders and citizens for engaging in bloodshed and failing to safeguard the sacredness of human life. And uh, here, that shed blood, the virtual bloodstains on Jerusalem's streets are likened to the corrosion in the old uncleaned cooking pot. It's got to be cleaned out. You've got to get rid of all those bloodstains. And in verse 11, uh, no, in, in, in verse 8, we, 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 we have a, a, a little um, 
uh, mention, a little metaphorical reference to, to blood, as being placed on a bare rock instead of being poured on, on, on the uh, ground. And in my commentary, I, I've, I've translated verse 8, I have placed the blood she shed on the bar, bare rock. I, I've, I've um, translated, I have permitted the blood to be left uncovered on the bare rock. And the thought is that the bloodshed was very blatant because you can think of bloodshed as falling down to the ground and then being absorbed by the ground and you don't notice it so much. But if you've got a bare rock then and the blood is put on that, oh, look at that blood, and it's so blatant and it's so very obvious. And to God, this bloodshed is so obvious and so blatant and it calls out to be, to be dealt with. And it's rather like uh, Genesis 4, where you had Abel's blood shed by Cain. And though it was uh, shed on the earth, the ground cried out to, for God to do something about it. And here God can see that bare rock covered in blood. And so it's so visible and so blatant that it has to be dealt with, that the administration uh, in Jerusalem has been responsible for killing off its citizens uh, for, the, for their own uh, sake and, and letting them die and doing n- nothing about it. Verse 13, Yet when I cleansed you in your filthy lewdness, you did not become clean from your filth. And this is a reference to 597. In a way, that was a chance for Jerusalem to reform itself after the uh, VIPs had gone in 597, and they should have said, well, we've got to clean up our act, or else it might happen again. Jerusalem should have said that, but it didn't. And things had gone from bad to worse, so God had to intervene again, uh, in fact, in 588, and then the actual fall of Jerusalem in 587. Where talking about the cleansing of the pot, and and we might think that that's something positive, but there's never any positive thought here, that cleansing is purely negative in dealing with the uh, bloodshed and getting rid of it uh, through the capture of Jerusalem. We come to the second day in verse 15 onwards, and this is a very traumatic and personal day for Ezekiel personally, and it involves uh, his own personal life and family because there's a symbolic action which uh, hurts Ezekiel very much. Verse 16, With one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Your wife is going to die. Your wife is going to die suddenly, just like that. And it's going to be a shock. And it's going to be... Uh, whenever she died, it would be a shock, but the suddenness would make it even more of a shock. For so long, she's been the delight of your eyes. And then suddenly, she's gone. She's dead. Well, now, normally, normally, when somebody in the family died, there would be a whole routine of mourning customs to express and alleviate, to some extent, the grief that one felt. Uh, and this, this would, uh, most, most cultures are, are, are like that. Um, though I, I, I don't see much sign of them in, in contemporary uh, USA. But when my mother died in the 1940s, uh, there was an elaborate ritual, and there was not only the funeral, but the the, the uh, curtains on the windows at the front of the house would be kept closed for many weeks. And we males in the family, we wore black ties, and we wore black armbands for many weeks. And this is what we did, and everybody would know their mourning. They would look at the house, they're mourning. They would look at the men, they're mourning. And the women would be dressed in black dresses, so on. 
And so it would be made very obvious. And so there will be this visual expression of grief. And I told you last time about that uh, African-American daughter whose father had just died in the hospital. And that wailing that woke up everybody in the hospital ward. Well, that, that is normal in many cultures. And it was normal in, in Israel. But here, very strangely, we might think, Ezekiel is told, the second part of verse 16, you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your sandals on your feet. Wear your ordinary clothing. And... uh, Do not cover your upper lip or eat the bread of mourners. And so there we are. He wasn't to have that that funeral meal and invite his rest of the family and friends. And so it's very striking. And in fact, in verse 18, his wife did die. And the next morning, I did as I commanded, went about my normal business showed no sign of mourning or grief at all. And this is the symbolic action that Ezekiel is to engage in. And he's not to put into operation any of the customs uh, that his own culture would regularly practice. He could only grieve inwardly. He was to dress normally, not to hold this special funeral meal. Now, his fellow prisoners of war recognize from what they know of Ezekiel that this must be a symbolic action or we might say lack of action in this case and verse 19 the people said to me will you not tell us what these things mean for us that you're acting in this way this is so abnormal that you're not engaging in these morning practices everybody does it and you're quite entitled to do it feel free oh Oh, well, and so the interpretation comes. The interpretation comes. And uh, Ezekiel has the opportunity in response to that questioning to pass on the interpretation and to be a witness to God's intentions. And uh, he can speak of the, of the uh, background of the whole situation behind the symbolic action, the... Uh, the, the, the corruption, the total breakdown of society in... in uh, no, he can say what's to come in 587. And what's to come is to be the complete breakdown of society. And all the norms of society are going to be uh, uh, done away with. And even though uh, children are going to die, verse 21, your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. He's saying that to the 597 uh, exiles. Uh, And yet, there is to be no mourning. And as Ezekiel had just lost his wife, they would suffer, the hostage, the uh, exiles of 597 would suffer bereavement. And and even worse, the, 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 the temple was, the lifeline, between God and Judah was going to be destroyed, an unthinkable uh, disaster, in fact. Verse 21, I will profane my sanctuary. And so, uh, which is the delight of the eyes of the Judean people. And so, life as people know it is going to collapse with 587. And when the prisoners of war hear of it, they're going to collapse in apathy. And they're going to be too devastated by their grief, even to carry out the normal, cultural, soothing customs. Too stunned even for tears. It's going to be overwhelming, this news of the fall of Jerusalem. And so even now, Ezekiel, bereaved Ezekiel, he was a sign pointing forward to this great crisis which was going to happen befalling the Judeans in Jerusalem and affecting in their grief the prisoners of war, their last hope of going home, taking away from them, hearing of their sons and daughters who'd been 
killed at the hands of the Babylonians back in Jerusalem. And so life was going to grind to a halt, and Ezekiel is to give expression to this. And then 25 to 27 is this last uh, section, and this this in, is another uh, uh, day that, 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 that's mentioned. It, it, it has to do very much with the uh, siege. It may have to do with the actual fall of Jerusalem after the siege. It's not made absolutely clear. But 26, it speaks of the day when somebody is, who's is escaped from Jerusalem and come all the way to, to Babylonia is going to come to you reporting the news of what's happened back in Jerusalem. And uh, that will be another fateful day. It's one thing for it to happen historically back in Jerusalem. It's another for the hostages to actually find out from a survivor, somebody who was actually there, who can say uh, with, with, with their own mouths that it is, has indeed happened. But there is there's going to be a, there's going to be a sort of a sort of happy ending for Ezekiel at this time, because it's going to mean the end of the ministry that he has been exercising concerning the destruction that was to take place in Jerusalem and uh, uh, Judah, and interpreting those things as the punishment of God. His work would be over. And along with it will be the ending of that old symbolic action. Remember in chapter 3 when he was going to be struck dumb and he, he would be housebound under house arrest as it were and he wouldn't have anything to say except those occasions when God opened his mouth to utter those prophecies of judgment. Well now, now he's told, on that day, is a forecast, verse 27. On that day, your mouth shall be opened. And to the one who has escaped, and you'll be able to talk with him, and you shall speak and no longer be silent. And so you shall be assigned to them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, it's very interesting, because Ezekiel is a sign to the, to the uh, exiles in two ways. We didn't mention it, but in verse 24, in all that lack of mourning uh, about the collapse of society, uh, Ezekiel shall be assigned to you. You shall do just as he has done. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. And uh, th- there is, there's, there's, one, there's one, uh, one commentator who sums up very nicely the... Uh, difference between those those uh, two, two, two days. In verse 24, Ezekiel is a sign of God's judgment and its consequences. In verse 27, he's a sign of God's grace and its consequences. And I think that's true. And we shall have to unpack that a little bit in the case of verse 27. And at this point, we need to remember, as I've often said, that the book of Ezekiel uh, especially in the first edition, falls into two hand, two halves, roughly, um, one to, to to twenty-four, and then uh, st- starting again uh, in um, in verse thirty, in chapter thirty-three, and moving on to the end of forty-eight. And there's this ministry of, of doom on the one hand, and there's this positive ministry on on the other. Uh, we also saw that in the second edition there was this pushing back of some of those positive messages into the uh, first half, but they were barbed positive messages, weren't they? But we're coming to the end of that bad news for the hostages, for the uh, exiles, those VIPs who were really being held hostage in, in Babylon to try and... Uh, prevent Judah from rebelling again, though that didn't work out very well. 
And so that's the end of that first phase, and we're going to be moving on to a, a, a new phase. And so implicitly, this is looking forward to that second part of the uh, uh, book, in, in, in fact. But we, we've also seen in our studies that um, there's this pushing back of, of, of material. Chapter 33, Ezekiel is a watchman. Push back to chapter 3, and the theme of commissioning Two types of commissioning, the old commissioning, the new commissioning, put side by side in chapters 2 and, and, and chapter 3. And in various ways, there's pushing back so that very obviously the second edition is meant for those, that whole group of exiles, not just the 597 ones, but the 587 ones who followed on the mass of people from Judah generally, not just the Jerusalem VIPs. And there's this pushing back and overall, there's this theme of judgment. Yes, in the context of salvation for the 587 people, but judgment still has a role. And I've spoken now and then of uh, judgment with a capital J and judgment with a uh, s- s- small j. And so, um, in a sense, we're, we're moving on to the new message, but we've already uh, had the privilege of listening to the new message uh, which has been interspersed among the old. So the whole thing can be read uh, as with direct uh, uh, messages applying to the 587 group. And very much there's the thinking that, that, that appears now and then that the exiles ought never to forget their past history in, in Jerusalem. Uh, they're, they're turning against God. Uh, okay, they're looking forward to better things in, in, in the future, but they needed to remember what had happened way, way, way back and that there was this, this great need to uh, do so. And as, as we've been uh, uh, reading through, well, when we come to the second half of the book, we're going to see it again very plainly in chapter 36 and, uh, and verse 31. Then, when you've gone back to the land, you shall remember your evil ways and your dealings that were not good, and you shall loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominable deeds. And that was a healthy remembering. That was a healthy remembering. Remembering what sinners they, they were, in fact, and so appreciating the grace of God and being determined not to do it again for God's sake, but to honor God. And so that message is very necessary. And we, we've had it before. We had it in uh, chapter 16 and uh, in, in verse 54. One of these messages that are post-587, I will restore your fortunes in order that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you've done. And there's this great need not to forget, not to forget what, what has uh, uh, happened. And, um, and similarly, I think, uh, there, there are these two facets of, of what we've just been talking about. Uh, judgment with a capital J, judgment with a small j on, on the one hand, and this need to remember, remember uh, from our unconverted lives and not to forget things. In a sense, bygones are bygones, but in another sense, we must never f- f- forget and one finds that the uh, New Testament wants to uh, bring out these uh, two aspects. And uh, that um, judgment with a small j, for instance, if we look at, at Romans 8 and verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. That is not an evangelical, an evangelistic warning. This is talking to Christians here in Romans 8. And you've got the choice of death or life. And there's that warning there. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul could warn his Christian readers, all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked, uh, for you reap uh, whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh, but if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the uh, Spirit. 
And then uh, along with that, we, we, we've, we've got a, uh, a message in, uh, in, in Romans uh, uh, chapter 6 and verse 7. Uh, the need for shame for Christians as they look back upon their past. They must never forget those shameful things. And that's very striking. 617. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, verse 21. Those things of which you are now ashamed, those things of which you are now ashamed, which were a mark of your pre-Christian lives. And then back in verse uh, 17, thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the new moral teaching of the uh, gospel. And there's never forgetting that was what you were, and you mustn't be like, like that now. And so that, that memory has got to be very strong, and it, it, it is very uh, uh, healthy in, in, in point of fact. But of course, in the New Testament, all this is radically different from that other judgment with a capital J. And we, we mentioned in an earlier lecture, Romans 1 to 3, the wrath of God. It's still a, a very important item in the, in, the, in the New Testament as in the New. The wrath of God that rests upon all, the judgment of God that rests upon all, but now saved from that judgment and, and uh, uh, moving into a new era of salvation. And in this case, in this case, we don't bear the judgment. In this case, with the small j, we do bear the judgment. But in, the, in that capital letter j, uh, we don't. God absorbed the judgment in the person of his son on the cross. But there's still that big judgment, still the small judgment. And there's, so this is where Ezekiel wants to be. And in the book, in the second edition, uh, you, you, you've got this mingling of these two types of judgment and throughout this call to remember that those past bad old ways but in the in the first edition there's a radical break you're moving from judgment to salvation and so this means that for ezekiel historically there's that move from pre 587 judgment to post 587 looking forward to salvation and so that that means that when we come to this final verse, uh, verse 24, you shall speak and no longer be silent, and you shall be assigned to them, because you're going to have plenty to say to them, but from now on, it's going to be some good stuff that they'll be glad to hear, and you perhaps will be much happier to be speaking about. And so it's looking ahead to that message of salvation, which we're going to have in succeeding uh, chapters. But next time, we've got to come to some little bridge material, the oracles against the foreign nations uh, in uh, chapter 25 uh, through uh, 26, which is the first half of the messages against the foreign nations. <laughs> This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number 12, Three Unforgettable Days. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 1 through verse 27.